Awesome. So yeah, this is full stack serverless with TypeScript. Um, yeah, I'm Jake Partouche. I am director of web and mobile at Object Partners. Uh, I've been doing development for uh, quite some time now, um, specializing kind of in, in front end stuff um, um, historically with uh, React and Vue, uh, but more uh, recently, I guess, I guess sort of my whole career, I've been, I've been doing full stack development for, for clients. Um, so more recently, I've been working a lot with serverless and TypeScript. And so I kind of wanted to bring everything that I've learned um, and kind of uh, share it with you all um, in my free time. I have uh, two kiddos. Uh, they keep me busy in, in my free time. Um, I have a golden retriever. Um, we, we built several snowmen uh, this, this, uh, this winter. So um, I'm a, I consider myself a mediocre snowman builder. So let's kind of dive right into it. What is full stack? Um, so I would say prior to 2010, there there was no, you know, there wasn't a full stack term around. Uh, there was just a, a stack and uh, there was no front end developers or back end developers or full stack developers. Uh, developers were just developers. Uh, the full stack term kind of came, became more popular around, um, you know, the early 2010s. So I think this kind of came came in with the single page application movement. So Angular JS uh, kind of popularized the single page application. So moving a lot of the logic from um, you know, to the front end to the client side, and so that allowed people to specialize in you know front end development. And so if there was a you know front end and a back end development uh, paradigms, then the full stack was you know the full stack developer was someone who could work in the front end or the back end and, and kind of be comfortable. So historically, this has kind of been, you know, that front end and back end split. And that makes you a, a, full, a full stack developer if you feel comfortable, you know, working, working with both. But I would say in 2021 is that's it's kind of changing a little bit um, and adding in infrastructure as well. So um, the way, the, the reason I say this is because, you know, in, in 2021, a lot of our applications that we're building are are more cloud native. Um, so we're using um, services, you know, whether it be AWS, GCP, Azure. Um, and when our applications are written for those services, then we kind of need to know how those applications or those, those services work uh, to make our applications run well. So um, I would say in 2021, we kind of not only need to be concerned about the front end and the back end, but also infrastructure. And so, some of us might, uh, myself included, might might feel a little bit like this. You know, you're a little bit uh, back end back end heavy, and you know, um, you know, a little bit lean on the front end, or or uh, maybe more commonly here at Nebraska JS, uh, like this. Your your front end, you're an expert on the front end, but your back end skills aren't 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 quite aren't quite there. But I guess what I'm trying to, um, what I what I my goal is to kind of give us some skills to hopefully be these uh, majestic um, horses and we can, we can uh, be full stack developers through and through um, and, and be productive at the same time. So one of the tools or, or development paradigms that we can use in doing this is uh, serverless. So why serverless? I'd say the, from a business cost perspective, one of the most appealing, appealing things is that serverless architectures uh, your your costs scale with your scale, uh, so you you are paying per request of your application. So, in a traditional in a traditional set uh, or traditional server uh, application, uh, you kind of see this step stone pattern of of scaling. So you have an application with a baseline set of you know I need one small uh, server to run my application, and then once you kind of get to peak load, uh, peak scale for that server, you have to upgrade either, you know, double, you have two small servers running or you have a medium sized server running. And then you kind of get that step stone pattern all the way up um, to scale with your application as it kind of grows in popularity. But with the serverless, uh, the serverless architecture, you're kind of from ground, from ground zero, you know, it costs nothing. And then when you scale, you know, to uh, a high load, then uh, it, it costs, you know, as much as, as, as much, just as much as you're using and not more. And so where I really think that's important or um, where I really think that comes into play is kind of at the lower end of the scale. That's where a lot of interesting things happen because 
you know, you don't, you don't necessarily for test environments and, and, and all that, when you're first starting out, um, you don't want your application to cost a lot of money. So you can spin up uh, an environment, you can spin down an environment, um, and you know, you're not gonna spend, be spending a lot of money with serverless because um, you're not using it or people aren't using it uh, a whole lot, so. Um, so yeah, during this uh, pandemic times, my wife and I have been watching a lot of uh, television as, as most might uh, attest to. Uh, so we've been specifically watching a lot of HGTV type shows. And so I kind of wanted to explain the difference between traditional and serverless applications um, from a cost perspective with a serverless house hunters example. So uh, see seemingly when, when folks are, are buying a house, at least on TV, um, they, they, they're always like, you know, I need a dining table that can seat 12 people. Even though there were only two people that live in this household, we need someone, a dining room table that can seat 12 so that, you know, when all the family comes over for Christmas, then um, we can we can have everyone, you know, sit at the table. And so I, I'd consider that as peak load purchasing. So they're they're buying the house or buying the table um, to fit as as many people as, you know, will ever be in the house. And so they're kind of over, over provisioning uh, their house uh, to, to support that peak load. On the contrary, like a serverless example, as far as house hunting might go, um, something I learned about recently, I, I guess I didn't know existed, uh, was that there's people that are Airbnb nomads. And so they don't own a house, they just travel from Airbnb to Airbnb. And I would say that's a, a good analogy for serverless because you know if they have a party coming up, they might rent a, a bigger um, Airbnb. If they are just hanging out at home, then you know just something small like this. All right, so serverless isn't all just about cost, cost and um, you know, pay per usage. Uh, I'd say it's a lot about productivity as well. So I think when I think of serverless, I think of uh, Lego, with Lego building blocks. So you have lots of different managed um, services that you're kind of building together to, to construct your application logic. So your, your business logic, those are the things that kind of make your business different than other businesses is that that core business logic, the application, you know, that user experience piece. So you don't want to spend a lot of time, you know, managing servers or uh, configuring authentication systems. Um, you want to spend all of your time, you know, working on that core business logic. And I think that serverless fits in that that paradigm really well. So let's take a look at a common AWS infrastructure um, using kind of some serverless building blocks. So this is using AWS and some of AWS's managed servers or serv services. Um, not all services on AWS are serverless, uh, but I picked some for this example. So this is kind of showing a, a new user signup flow. So we have uh, a user, they come in via their phone and they want to sign up for um, you know, the, the service. They want, to, they want to start using whatever you're building. And so their first interaction with the service is they need to create a new account via Cognito. Um, and then, you know, after they've authenticated with Cognito, they're redirected to CloudFront and can get the, the website that's hosted in S3 up through and, and kind of start working with the website. Um, Cognito might tell that user or take that user that was created and pipe it through an API gateway Lambda connection uh, to get stored in, in DynamoDB. Um, and then that might asynchronously trigger off an email to let the user know or to give them some sort of welcome email or something like that. So that's just kind of a, a typical um, you know, serverless. You take these different serverless building blocks, piece them together to create a, a new user sign up flow. So one of the common, um, common, common things I hear about people that are kind of nervous and in getting into service, serverless architecture is, you know, isn't it, aren't I, you know, really tied to AWS? Is, is, it, is it kind of, am I building my application on, AD, on AWS and I can't ever move off of it? Well, what I would say about, about using these serverless pieces as, you know, decoupled building blocks is that you can take the core pieces of your business and if you need to switch them out with something else, then you can. So in this example, 
we've taken out our Cognito um, building block here and replaced it with Auth0, which is a third-party authentication provider. And we've also taken out our SES um, component and replaced it with SendGrid. So you can kind of pick and choose the different pieces of your application that are important to you. And if a third-party provider does that specific thing really well, then you might choose um, that thing. Um, we still have our core application logic in AWS, and that's, that's probably OK. Uh, AWS does these things really well. Um, some of those, you know, side services are kind of the, the pieces that you might want to pick pick and choose to kind of differentiate yourself or build a build a better experience with uh, by kind of going custom you could build you could build a custom building block if it's a really important piece to your business or you could pick an off-the-shelf third-party piece to kind of put in there so why typescript um, there's roughly a million a million reasons to use TypeScript and, and Nick Nisi can, can name them all, but I'm just gonna focus on one for this uh, talk today. And that's because TypeScript is supported, um, is the only language that I can really think of um, that is supported on modern front end um, frameworks, back end frameworks, and also infrastructure frameworks. And I'd say that this is uh, infrastructure as code with TypeScript is a, a relatively new thing. And so that's kind of going to be one of the key pieces that, that we're going to show here in a minute. So without further ado, let's get on to our demo. But maybe I can just stop right here for a second. And if anyone has any questions, we can talk about them now. Alrighty, we'll keep, keep going and there'll be a couple more opportunities for questions after the demo and, and everything. So um, so the demo that I built out for this talk is a an admin panel for kind of a um, an ordering system. So you can kind of see in the screenshot, we, get, we got a couple orders coming in. Um, one second, I wanna dock this Zoom thing somewhere else. Maybe. There's no good spot for the Zoom controls. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you put it. It always covers up the next thing you need. Um, yeah, one second. How do you actually move it? I, I've been using Teams for so long that. Is there a way to dock it to the side, maybe? I think you just click and drag it. Oh, there we go. That's better. Thank you. OK. All right, so uh, this is our live, running, uh, it, our live running demo. And so if I refresh here, you can see it has a little loading spinner. And then it loads our, our recent activity, our orders for our kind of our order management system. And so this is running in AWS. It's got its own URL and everything. Um, and so what this is is a React application with um, using Snowpack. Um, that's not really super relevant, but um, it's using a GraphQL API running on uh, behind an API gateway on a Lambda um, and then pulling those records from DynamoDB. And so we can kind of look at the architecture here. So we have, um, we have all those pieces together and these are kind of our building blocks for our application today. And so what we're going to do here in a minute is kind of go through and make a couple of changes to our demo app, um, kind of illustrate how TypeScript and um, can help us manage our, our application across the entire stack. And you could just kind of see how those changes flow through. So let's switch over to VS Code. So let's kind of get the lay of the land here in our VS Code um, project. So we have at the kind of the base of our project, we have a source folder. Uh, so this is our React application. So I like create React app. Um, all of these files in here are all, are all TypeScript files, TSX files. Uh, so in our components folder, we have you know, the components for our application. Um, so that's kind of a, your standard top-down um, application. And then um, all the components are nested under there. 
In our functions folder, that's kind of where our API lives. So we have a, a GraphQL file and a GraphQL.ts file in here. And um, so this is an Apollo server running in a Lambda and it's kind of responsible for interacting with Dynamo, pulling those records and um, returning the responses. And finally, we have our infrastructure folder. So this is our um, cloud development kit, our Amazon uh, CDK project. And so the thing that's kind of unique or interesting about um, CDK is that it's natively written in, in TypeScript and it has ports for other languages as well. Um, I picked TypeScript because I like the fact that I can write all my code in my entire project, my front end, my back end, and my infrastructure all in TypeScript. Um, so we can look in here and take a look at our infrastructure stack. And maybe just for a moment, just take a look at, you know, how to create a table with uh, the CDK because this is maybe the most uh, unfamiliar part uh, for, for many folks is this uh, infrastructure as code with TypeScript. So we're importing a table construct from the AWS CDK package. So you can kind of see up here, uh, we have the AWS CDK, DynamoDB um, package, and we're importing table from there. So we're creating a new table and then we specify some configuration for it. So for DynamoDB tables, um, partition keys and sort keys are, are required to create them. So we're defining the name of our partition key and the name of our sort key. I shouldn't say sort key is required. It's not technically required. You can just go with the partition key, but um, these are some of the configuration parties on uh, properties on a table. Also switching the billing mode to paper requests. So kind of like uh, like we want our service, serverless applications to be, we only want to pay for what we use. Um, by default, the billing mode is provisioned. So you can provision um, you know, units of, of DynamoDB uh, pre-provision that if you'd like. Uh, this removal policy isn't really um, relevant. Uh, we probably wouldn't have this set to destroy in production. I'm just uh, was doing that for uh, quick prototyping. All right, so we have kind of the lay of the land, um, understand what's kind of how our project's set up. So the first thing that we're going to do uh, is we're going to make a code change to our project to allow for our, if we go back to our dashboard, maybe it'll make a little bit more sense. Right now we're only showing pending orders and our orders uh, recent activity page. We're gonna make a change to the project to allow either pending or shipped orders to show up in here. So where we're gonna start is at our GraphQL schema. So this is kind of the contract between our front end and our back end code. And, and maybe before I, I get too much further, I wanna note that I'm using um, another library that's kind of cool in my opinion um, to integrate our GraphQL schema with our TypeScript types. Uh, so that project is called uh, GraphQL CodeGen. And so I have this pulled up. This is their website, GraphQL CodeGen. It's an open source project. And basically what it does is it takes, takes in your GraphQL schema and can spit out uh, TypeScript types. And so we're gonna use that pretty extensively here in this example. I should note that in order to do you know, full stack TypeScript, you don't need to use GraphQL and you don't necessarily need to use um, GraphQL code generator. Uh, I just did this for the example because it's, it's easy to illustrate um, the benefits of the typing system across your application with, with these two tools. So the first thing that we're gonna do, like, like I mentioned, is that we're, gonna, we're going to switch this query, this find orders query to take an array of statuses rather than a single status. So we're going to, going to switch this to um, plural statuses and take an array. So it's requiring that you pass in an array with at least one item. And so that's the only change we need to make to our, our base schema file. We have a, a dashboard GraphQL file and this holds our queries for the dashboard. So we're going to make the same um, corresponding changes here. And rename these things from status to statuses. Cool. So we 
next thing we're going to do is we're going to run yarn generate. So that's going to kick off our GraphQL code generator. So it's going to slurp up these um, GraphQL files and spit out uh, TypeScript definitions that kind of correspond to our, um, our GraphQL schema. And so we see that this ran pretty quickly and it spit out those, uh, those TypeScript files. So the next thing we're going to do is run yarn build on our project to make sure uh, to see, you know, if we change some stuff in our GraphQL schema, we would expect some things to break. And we do. So the first thing that we see is uh, our resolver, our um, Lambda function has, sorry, um, has a type error now. So we have uh, our status, you know, we rename that to statuses. So um, our type, our, our types that were generated for our uh, GraphQL function are no longer matching um, what we had coded. So uh, we're going to change that from status to statuses and change this from status to statuses as well. Um, now our function is was expecting a single status, but um, we need an array of statuses now. So um, luckily, I wrote something ahead of time. And we can just fetch orders by status codes instead of statuses. So this is kind of cool. GraphQL code gen took our schema and generated the resolvers, um, fully typed resolvers uh, for uh, our schema. And so we got type safety um, for our, our GraphQL function in here. Um, and so that's pretty neat. So let's head back to here and see, OK, we have another error in our dashboard.tsx file. So our dashboard TSX file is kind of the main uh, root entry level for our, our dashboard. If we remember, our dashboard is um, our application running here. So it's got you know this this recent activity stuff in here. So we have a TypeScript error, and it's saying you know uh, we're passing in a variable called status with status pending. If we remember our our the thing that we're trying to to fix or the uh, the business requirement we're trying to solve is to pass in uh, both status and shipped uh, statuses to our dashboard. So let's go ahead and change this to an array. And you see we've got some autocomplete in here too. Um, so now we can pass in our, our array of statuses, both pending and shipped. Um, one thing that I should note is it's using um, our GraphQL code generator also can generate, um, you can define plugins for, let's go and look at that real quick. Can de define plugins and one of them is uh, React Apollo. So the React Apollo plugin will generate these, um, these hooks for you. Uh, so we have a hook that's called use find orders query. So it, it generates that hook and um, fully types all of the variables that you pass into it. Uh, so that's really cool. We can have fully typed um, integration on our front end to make sure that we're interacting with our GraphQL schema like, like we had planned. So let's run yarn build one more time. The front end completed and the infrastructure is code is done. Awesome. So for our first example, we we kind of recap what we did here. We changed um, status to statuses. We passed in an array of statuses into our query. Um, we ran the code generator. It updated all of the types for our application. Uh, for our GraphQL resolvers, we, we caught a, an error where we were referencing status instead of statuses. And um, we needed to fetch order orders by status codes instead of a singular status code. Also in our dashboard, we were passing a status variable instead of statuses and not an array. And so we kind of caught an we caught errors on both uh, the front end side of our code and the back end side. So we had that fully typed uh, for, their, for um, both things. And that's that's pretty neat. All right, so for our ne next example, this is more of a, not necessarily a business requirement, but kind of a, a code cleanup thing. So for our order object, we specified an attribute called customer full name. 
And so uh, we decided as a development team, we wanted to um, switch this to be its own type. And so we're gonna make a new type called uh, customer. And so this customer has an ID, uh, first name, last name, and full name. Cool, so we have a new type called customer. It has these uh, couple of new attributes and then also has the full name again. Uh, so we're gonna switch our order to use a customer instead of um, the customer type, instead of having customer full name kind of in our order at the root level. So we made our change to our base schema. Again, we'll have to open up that, that dashboard GraphQL file and we're gonna have to change this fragment where it was pulling the customer full name to grab uh, our complex you know, attribute customer. And then we only need, we don't need the first name. Uh, we don't need the, the last name or the ID. We just need the full name from here. So those are the two changes we're going to make to our GraphQL schema. So if we run yarn generate again, should spit out some new types for us. And while we're in here, we can run yarn build to see where our new type errors are. Cool, so we have one here, a new file we haven't looked at yet. Um, it's called order row.tsx. So if we go back to our application, our order row component is this, this row, uh, it has an order item in it. And it says order from Molly Sanders. Um, so right now, it's, we, we see that there's an error order from, and then it's referencing customer full name in here. And we want it to reference our new path, which is customer dot full name. So I think that one is, is very special because uh, if this were written in JavaScript, I almost certainly would have forgotten to, to change this way deep down here in our component tree. And I would have found that bug at runtime and hopefully not in production, but maybe in production as well. So I, I'm a fan of that. All right, so let's run yarn build again, see if we have any more errors. Okay, so it looks like we have an error in our infrastructure project, which we haven't had yet. So it looks like our front end um, and back end built fine, but then when it tried to build the infrastructure project, uh, we got an error here in our infrastructure stack. So let's go take a look. Sometimes it takes VS Code a minute to catch up. There we go. So to kind of give a little bit of background on, on why this error is happening, we have to understand a little bit about DynamoDB. So for DynamoDB, you can by default query on the partition key um, and sort key in combination. But if you wanna do uh, more complex type queries, uh, you have to create uh, secondary indexes. And so that's what I had done already is created a secondary index uh, to query on for some of the more complex queries for this application. And so we see we're defining our, our global secondary index here. It's got a name. It's, it's really sim uh, very similar to the way you define a table. Uh, you define the partition key and the sort key. Um, the thing that's kind of unique about this one is we didn't want to copy over all of the attributes from the table. We only wanted to copy over the attributes that we specified in here. Uh, so copying over all the attributes in an in a index can be, um, you know, kind of over, over provisioning or more expensive than, than we need it to be. So we're only copying over the ones that we need. Uh, so we kind of specified those in a list here. And this type, if we kind of dig into why this area is showing up a little bit more, it's defined up at the top. And it's saying that we want our, the available attributes to be our keys on our order object. And so that order object, that order type is um, defined, generated based off of our GraphQL schema. And so we can only specify the keys um, if they exist on our order type 
And right now, since we changed what our order looks like, uh, customer full name is no longer there. So to fix that, we, we can look at the different um, attributes we have on order and we see that we have customer now and not customer full name. So that um, fixes our, our attributes that we're copying over to our secondary index. And I guess I just want to reiterate that this is this is kind of a, a cool um, a cool bug or a type check that uh, we found here. Basically, by uh, changing our, our our GraphQL schema and regenerating some types, we were able to find a potential bug way down here um, in our uh, front end code, and then we were also able to make sure that we had taken into account that this secondary index is changing in our DynamoDB table or needs to change. Um, likely this might have been forgotten if it was in a YAML file um, or you know some JSON config. Uh, we don't type check those and so we might not have found that and um, the next time we queried on this index that the attribute that we we're expecting to be there may not have been there. So I think that's that's really cool and kind of shows the power of using TypeScript across the entire application, both the front end and the back end uh, and the infrastructure is that we can kind of define those, you can have that type safety across the entire, the entire stack um, that helps you um, basically find all of the bugs in your IDE before you even uh, build and push to production. So the, to kind of, um, bring it full circle like a like a good celebrity chef. I already have uh, baked this application and, and we're going to take it out of the oven now. So you see we have this uh, preview URL that I generated for this application. And you see we are have our orders, both pending and shipped orders are in here. So yay. Awesome. So back to here. This time um, I'm gonna stop for a few seconds. I do have a little bit more, but it's uh, kind of extra content. Uh, so if we have any questions about what we've talked about so far, now would be a great time. I was told that on video calls, you're supposed to count to 12. There is a question in the chat awesome. uh, from, from Wayne. I'll read it. Can you walk through the yarn build to show how they are connected? Yeah, I can. So the build. So the, the two things it does is it does a snowpack build. So we're using snowpack under the hood for the front end code. And the reason it finds also those um, we're not using, um, I should switch us to use uh, Yarn Workspaces or Lerna. Um, and so we could kind of run these all in one command, but uh, basically since it thinks that this functions folder is part of the, the React project, so it goes ahead and, and checks, does the type checking for that as well uh, in the snowpack build command. And so that build command will, after it runs the type checking and everything, it'll um, spit out all of the the JavaScript and HTML files that are required to deploy your React application. And then after that, it goes into our infrastructure folders and runs a synth. And so that's a special uh, CDK command that basis, basically generates the CloudFormation templates from your TypeScript code. So it executes all of your TypeScript, TypeScript code um, in your stack and generates um, CloudFormation templates off of that. So we want to take a look at that real quick. Uh, generates a huge JSON file that you don't have to write by hand anymore. You can just write TypeScript and it'll generate the JSON for you. And that's what ends up getting deployed to AWS. I have a question um, kind of about the about the the functions themselves, like when you're developing those, maybe I missed it, but how do you um, work on those locally, or do you have to like deploy each time to to test those? Um, yeah, there's a couple of different ways. So depending on, 
So for this example specifically, um, I could run this locally because it's just um, basically Apollo server. Uh, so I could run this function locally. A lot of times though with serverless architectures, um, since the deploys in the cloud environment happen are happening faster and faster every day, um, a lot of times I'll just push up a deploy preview, uh, kind of like I had here. And so you know that you're running on all, all the infrastructure that um, you know, a real DynamoDB table, um, real Lambdas, and, you know, you have a, a unique URL that you can use to test your application. So a lot of times I will just deploy it. Um, and, you know, that may take a little bit longer than developing locally. Uh, if I'm, if I'm feeling like I'm not very confident in my code, then um, I'll write some just tests around the functions and see, you know, just to kind of get that initial, like, I have accounted for all the things I think I should account for. And then um, after those just has passed, then I might uh, just push it up as a deploy preview. So I'll kind of talk in a second. Um, if we don't have any other questions, I can talk how this, this function itself gets deployed because TypeScript isn't natively supported by um, AWS and uh, Lambda functions. So we can kind of talk about how that all works if we don't have any other questions. If you do have questions, like to, we can I would can like have, to hear that, but I would just throw out there that uh, AWS Lambda fairly recently, like in the last few months, uh, now has like first party support for containers. So there are Docker base images that can run a Lambda function locally. It's really slick if you haven't tried it. Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah, I have not tried that. Um, and I think that the, yeah, the running locally stuff. So I've used um, local stack to kind of run Docker containers locally for developing lambdas and, and DynamoDB. I think it, it gets you most of the way there. And if you want to, if you really want to run locally, then that those are good options. Um, the things that I've run into is just the discrepancies because you're trying to basically recreate AWS on your uh, local machine. And so uh, you just kind of have discrepancies that, you know, you might spend a lot of time debugging the way this queue is working on your local machine, but in reality on AWS, it's, it's working just fine. So um, just kind of those things. And yeah, I think that the Docker support on, on Lambda is kind of a, a cool thing. Uh, I haven't used it yet myself. Um, yeah. I totally agree. I, I would, I shy away pretty strongly from trying to like end to end test the whole complicated stack locally. But if you just need to invoke a function with the first party container support now, it, it's really, really easy. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Yeah, sorry to butt in. Um, if if you're curious, there there is a, a new project I found that lets you build um, CDK, and it'll actually be able to set up a proxy. It'll proxy request from AWS into a local Lambda. So kind of handles, takes care of that for you. It's called serverless stack. Post it in the chat. Awesome. I have heard of serverless stack, and uh, it sounded like uh, David. How's it going? Hey, good to see you. <laughs> um, yeah, that sounds that sounds like a really interesting project. They've been doing a lot of cool stuff. So I haven't used it yet, but it sounds really cool. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I'll just talk for just a two minutes about uh, something I've been working on recently, and then we can kind of uh, talk about everything. Uh, keep talking. So yeah, I like all of the questions. So something I've been working on and released uh, about a month ago was is called serverless UI. Uh, so I took what I've learned around building uh, websites, um, kind of kind of driven from the website uh, side of things, and um, built this command line utility slash um, AWS CDK construct um, around the that common AWS infrastructure. So this works on AWS uh, specifically, but um, kind of how it works is under the hood, it's using the CDK constructs and kind of scaffolding out like a project, kind of like our infrastructure project here. And it has some custom uh, CDK constructs to, to do the, um, those more common things like we were talking about earlier, the CloudFront S3 Lambda API gateway stuff. It does all that for you. Um, and so if you're kind of out of the box using your serverless application, you have um, your functions in a functions folder, 
and you just want to use the CLI, then it, it'll deploy all that for you. Uh, all you have to do is really uh, configure your AWS credentials locally, and then you can um, install the CLI and deploy, uh, point it to that directory. So the way that this application that I kind of went through in the demo today is working is kind of the a little bit uh, more advanced version of the same thing. And so we're, we do have a CDK project stood up here, um, but it's using that custom construct. And so you see we have a serverless UI construct that we're importing from um, the package. And we kind of define these properties. So we define where our UI sources folder is. And so that's that build directory that Snowpack creates. And then also where our API files are, and that's that graphql.ts file, which is in our functions folder. And so um, this is still you know, relatively uh, in its infancy, this project, but I've been using it all my, all my uh, side projects recently. It's been working out really well. And so um, it also has the ability to configure custom domains and, and uh, SSL certs. And so um, it's been working good for what I've been doing so far. And so yeah, enough of uh, shameless plugging. Um, and I kind of want to wrap it up and say, you know, I think that we may be coming to a point where, you know, the generalists are needed to kind of wire together all of these different um, services, these, um, all these third party services, all these AWS services, kind of wire them together, uh, be those Lego builders. And I think that we may be coming to a point where um, we just become developers again and not full stack developers, front end developers, back end developers. We're just developers uh, using all of the tools that are at hand uh, to build awesome applications. So I'm not sure if that's what, where the future's headed, but it kind of feels that way sometimes. So just wanted to put that out there. But um, otherwise, I don't have anything else. Uh, it's been great speaking with everyone. And I'm, I'm here to stick around for a while if we want to chat about whatever. Thank you.